Today we're going to look at a certain matrix that you learn about in linear algebra that shows up in a lot of different places, and that is the Vandermonde matrix. So let's see what it looks like. Well, I'll call the nth Vandermonde matrix V sub n, and it's the matrix that's made of, well, it starts with a column of ones, and then you have a column given by x0, x1, x2, down to xn, and then you have a column of the squares of all of those. Then you'll have a column of the cubes of all of those, all the way up to the column of the n powers of all of those. And now if we revisit this first column, notice that's a column of the zeroth power of all of those, so that fits this format as well. Let's notice that this is an n plus one by n plus one matrix. And maybe the most common exercise that you come across in linear algebra when you're working with a van der Mond matrix is to find its determinant. And it has this nice formula. The determinant of the nth van der Mond matrix is the product over all i and j between zero and n, where i is less than j, of xj minus xi. Okay, so let's look at a little example before we like jump in to proving this claim. So let's look at the determinant of the matrix with 1, 1, 1, x, y, z, and then x squared, y squared, and z squared. And we want to think of this as x playing the role of x0, y is playing the role of x1, and z is playing the role of x2. So that allows us to apply this claim pretty easily. So we'll have, well, x1 minus x0, but that's y minus x in this case. And then we'll have z minus y, that's like x2 minus x1. And then finally, z minus x, that's like x2 minus x0. And there's our determinant. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's like prove this general formula for the determinant. Okay, so the way that we will calculate this determinant is by doing row and column operations and keeping track of the changes to the determinant after doing those operations. Okay, so let's start with some column operations. So I'll write Vn here. And this arrow right here will be some column operations. And I'm going to write it like this. So we'll have Cj, that's the jth column, minus x0 times Cj minus 1, that's the j minus first column, is going to become my new, or I'll put an arrow here, so it becomes my new jth column. And that's going to be for all of the columns that make sense, which is all of the columns except for this very, very first column, or really the zeroth column here. So here this is going to hold for all j between 1 and n. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So like I said, this first column will be exactly the same, so let's just copy that over. So 1, 1, all the way down here. And then this second column, will be x0 minus x0 times 1. So that's just 0. And then we'll have 1 minus x0 times 1. So that'll be x1 minus x0. All the way down here, we'll have xn minus x0 times 1. Well, that's xn minus x0. Then here, we'll have x0 squared minus x0 times x0. So that's going to give us another 0. And then we'll have x1 squared minus x0 times x1. Well, that allows us to factor out an x1, and then we'll have x1 minus x0. All the way down here, we'll have x0 times xn minus xn. So we can factor an xn out, and then we'll have xn minus x0. And then this like kind of pattern is going to continue all the way down to this last column, where we will have x0 to the n minus 1, and then x1 minus x0, all the way down to, let's see, xn to the n minus 1, and then xn minus x0. Okay, so that's our first round of column operations. And if you recall from linear algebra, this is the type of column operation where you add a multiple of one column to another and you replace that column and this does not change the determinant. It kind of surprisingly, or at least it's surprising to me that it doesn't change the determinant. Although if you work it all out, it's pretty clear that it doesn't. So, but let's make a little note of this. So this one does not change 
the determinant. Okay, and now we're gonna do a round of row operations because let's notice that every term in this first row has a multiple of x1 minus x0 except for the first term. Every term in the second row will have a multiple of x2 minus x0. All the way down here, everything in this last row will have a multiple of xn minus x0. Okay, so let's write that out here. So we'll take our jth row, I'll write that as rj, and we'll multiply that by one over, let's see, it's xj minus x0, and that becomes my new jth row. And again, I'm gonna do this for all of the rows except for the zeroth row. So that'll be one is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to n. Okay, so now let's look at what our matrix looks like. So I didn't do that for the first row, so that's just gonna be one and then a bunch of zeros but I did do it for the next row. So this entry right here will become one over x1 minus x0, so that's a little bit strange, but that's okay. And then the next one will become one, and then the next one after that will become x1. It's because we divided x1 minus x0. And then as you can see, the last one will be x1 to the n minus one. That should have been an x1. Okay, great. Now let's see what we have for the next bit. I'll write the next row. So we'll have one over x2 minus x0. We'll have a one, we'll have an x2, all the way down to x2 to the n minus one. And then let's see, my last row will be one over xn minus x0. We'll have a one there. And then we'll have an xn all the way down to an xn to the n minus one. Okay, nice. But this did change the determinant. What this did is it multiplied the determinant by all of these numbers right here. So let's see, we could write them all out. One over x1 minus x0, x2 minus x0, all the way down xn minus x0. But then the next little observation we wanna make is that what's left over here, this sub matrix, looks pretty much exactly like the n minus first Vandermonde matrix. Well, not exactly because our variables are named a little bit differently. We have x1 instead of x0, x2 instead of x1, xn instead of, well, it would be xn minus one. But up to that naming, it's exactly the same. But now we can write down the determinant of our vn using this setup. So we have the determinant of Vn is equal to, well, it's gonna be this product of these things in the denominator, just because what happened is the determinant of what's left over is the determinant of what we started with times this reciprocal. So if we flip that around, these flip up to the numerator. So I'm gonna write it x1 minus x0, x2 minus x0, all the way up to xn minus x0. And then we're left with the determinant of this n minus first Vandermonde matrix. Well, where those roles are being changed a little bit. And now we're gonna apply an induction hypothesis, which we didn't write down carefully, but applying like, like I said, an induction hypothesis, which assumes we already know what's going on in the n minus first case, allows us to write the determinant of this as the product where i is less than j, they're both bigger than or equal to one because of our role switch here, and they are less than or equal to n of xj minus xi. But now all that's missing from this final formula inside of this product is the case where i is equal to zero, but that's within this bit that we picked up from doing the row operations. So if we push these into this product, we'll have exactly what we need over here. Okay, so now we found this nice form for the Vandermonde determinant. Now let's apply this to a nice problem. So this nice application of the Vandermonde determinant formula is from this math competition that I found. And so let's define f of x as the determinant of the following four by four matrix. So in the first column, we have one natural log of x, natural log of x squared, natural log of x cubed. 
In the second, one two times natural log of x and then its square and its cube. One three natural log of x, its square and its cube. One four natural log of x and its square and its cube. So let's notice that this is the transpose of what we called the van der Moen matrix, but taking the transpose doesn't change the determinant. And then let's also do a little bit of a translation so we know like x0, x1, and x2 here. So here x0 would be natural log of x, x1 would be 2 times natural log of x, x2 would be 3 times natural log of x, and x3 would be 4 times natural log of x. And then I guess I should say in the end, we want to find the area under the curve defined by this function between 1 and e. Okay, well let's first get a nice, maybe closed form for this function. And we'll use the van der Moen determinant formula. So we need to do x1 minus x0 x2 minus x1, x2 minus x0, and so on and so forth. So let's start with x1 minus x0. Well, that pretty clearly gives us just the natural log of x. Then moving on to x2 minus x1, that's going to be another natural log of x. So I'll put natural log of x squared here. And then x2 minus x0, well, that's 3 minus 1, so that's 2 natural log of x. But that's going to bring this square up to a cube and then multiply by 2. Okay, so now we've built all the way up to using x2. Now let's use x3. So we need x3 minus x2. So that's 4 minus 3 natural log of x. That's going to bring this up to a fourth power. And then we have x3 minus x1. That'll be 4 minus 2, which is 2, another natural log of x. So that'll give us a 4 here and a fifth power there. And then x3 minus x0. So that'll give us 3 natural log of x. That'll build this power up again and multiply by 3, giving us 12. Okay, so there we've got a nice formula for our function to work with now. Now, let's notice our area will be the integral from 1 to e of the natural log of x to the 6th power and then times a 12, which I'll put out front. So I think the classic way to do this would be with a u substitution, or maybe I'll write a t substitution. So let's t, let t be the natural log of x. So that means x is equal to e to the t, which tells us that dx is e to the t dt. Let's also notice when x is equal to 1, that tells us that t is 0. And when x is equal to e, that tells us that t is 1. That's how our bounds of integration change. Okay, so that's enough information to totally change our integral. And what it'll change to is, well, we'll have a 12, and then the integral from zero to one of t to the six times e to the t dt. And now I think we could finish this up with doing a tabular integration to find the antiderivative for this. Let's put it right here. Okay, so now we're set up for our tabular integration or di method. So I've put my polynomial term here, t to the sixth, my exponential term here, I'll take derivatives down this column, antiderivatives down this column. So this, this will start off with 6t to the 5, we'll have 30t to the 4, that'll give us 120t uh, cubed, 360t squared, 720t, 720, and then 0. Then when we hit 0, we know that we don't need to go any further. But notice all of these will simply be just e to the t's, given the derivative and the antiderivative of e to the t is simply e to the t. And now we do the standard trick. We match everything on the diagonal. This is simple because we just match everything with e to the t. And then we alternate the signs. So that gives us something like that. Okay, so now let's write this antiderivative down. Keep my 12 e to the t out front because everything has an e to the t in it. And then I'll have t to the 6 minus 6t to the 5 plus 30t to the 4, and then minus 120t cubed plus 360t squared minus 720t, and then plus 720. And we need to evaluate that from t going from 0 to 1.
And now it's really just a matter of arithmetic and I'll just write the final answer down. We have a 12 out front, then you know that's kind of staying for this whole thing. And then we have 265 times E minus 720. So that 720 term that we get on its own comes from plugging zero in and keeping the constant. All of the other terms cancel. And that would be our final answer. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.